So now I'm neo natives. Huh. Today I wanted to uh, to make this fun little video about uh, this little reading I did this morning. I wanted to share it with you, especially because uh, th there's a new popular thing. I mean, it's not new, but I mean, a lot of people are like to talk about the Mandela effect uh, these days. It's funny. Uh, for those of you who know what the Mandela effect is, uh, it doesn't necessarily affect everyone, you know, it only affects certain groups of people, um, or it might only affect, you know, one person like you, there might be a personal Mandela effect in your own life that, you know, nobody else shares it, it like what it, it means that you have a memory different of what the reality is now, whatever that means, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a funny kind of phenomenon. Anyway, um, I was drawn to pull out this book this morning called Lamb, uh, The Gospel According to Biff, Christ's Childhood Pal by Christopher Moore. This book's hilarious, okay? I haven't read it in a long time. I think I was in high school when I read this for the, you know, only read it once. Uh, so I don't really remember that much about it. I remember loosely, right? But this is like a personal Mandela effect in this book for me and if any of you have read this and and like it and hear the passage that I'm about to read and it's a Mandela effect for you too <laughs> it would be hilarious you know that would be funny but it might not too it might just be some fluke thing anyway I just thought it was funny anyway like I said I didn't remember very much about this book because I read it back in high school so this detail you know obviously it was in there and I didn't remember but it created this kind of <laughs> Mandela effect where it's like huh you know I don't remember that happening anyway so I just opened to this random passage and read it you know, and I was like, huh, that's a little Mandela effect. I'm not going to tell you specifically what it is, because if you pick up on it too, then, then you'll know. If not, then it's nothing. It's just something I noticed that was funny, you know? All right. So this is it. I'm going to read this little passage to you. All right. In the morning, Joy came to our rooms, wearing the garb of a desert trader, a loose tunic, soft leather boots and pantaloons. Her hair was tied up under a turban, and she carried a long riding crop in her hand. She led us through a long, narrow passageway that went deep into the mountain, then emerged out of the side of a sheer cliff. We climbed a rope ladder to the top of the plateau where Pillows and Sue awaited, waited, with three camels saddled and outfitted for a short journey. There was a small farm on the plateau with several pens full of chickens, some goats, and a few pigs in a pen. We're going to have a tough time getting these camels down that ladder, I said. For those of you who haven't read this book, it, it, the narrator is, is Biff. Okay, so when it says I, that's Biff talking. Joy scowled and wrapped the tail, um, Joy scowled and wrapped the tail of her turban around her face so that only her eyes showed. There's a path down, she said. Then she tapped her camel on the shoulder with her crop and rode off, uh, leaving Joshua and me to scramble onto our animals and follow. The road down from the plateau was just wide enough for a single camel to sway his way down without falling. But once down on the desert floor, much like the entrance to the canyon where the fortress's entrance lay, if you didn't know it was there, you would never have found it. An added measure of security for a fortress that had no guards, I thought. Joshua and I tried to engage Joy in conversation several times during the journey to Kabul, but she was cranky and abrupt and often just rode away from us. Probably depressed that she's not torturing me, I speculated. I can see how that might bring her down, said Joshua. Maybe if you could get your camel to bite you. I know that always brightens my mood. <laughs> I rode on ahead without another word. It's wildly irritating to have invented something as revolutionary as sarcasm, only to have it abused by amateurs. <laughs> Once in Kabul, 
Joy led the search for the blinded guard by asking every blind beggar that we passed in the marketplace, have you seen a blind bowman who arrived by camel caravan a little more than a week ago? Joshua and I trailed several steps behind her, trying desperately to keep from grinning whenever she looked back. Joshua had wanted to point out the flaw in Joy's method, while I, on the other hand, wanted to savor her <laughs> do doofuscosity. That's a great word. Savor her doofuscosity as passive revenge for having been poisoned. There was none of the competence and self-assured nature she showed at the fortress. She was clearly out of her element, and I was enjoying it. <laughs> you see, I explained to Joshua, what Joy is doing is ironic. Yet that's not her intent. That's the difference between irony and sarcasm. Irony can be spontaneous, while sarcasm requires volition. You have to create sarcasm. No kidding? said Josh. Why do I waste my time with you? We indulged Joy's search for the blind man for another hour before directing our inquiries to the sighted and to men from the camel caravans in particular. Once she started asking sighted people, it was a short time before we were directed to a temple where the blinded guard was said to have staked uh, his begging territory. There he is, said Joshua, pointing to a ragged pile of human being beckoning to the worshippers as they moved in and out of the temple. It looks like things have been tough on him, I said, amazed that the guard, who had been one of the most vital and frightening men I'd ever seen, had been reduced to such a pathetic creature in a short time. Then again, I was discounting the theatrics of it all. A great injustice has been done here, said Josh. He moved to the guard and gently put his hand on the blind man's shoulder. Brother, I am here to relieve your suffering. Pity on the blind, said the guard, waving around a wooden bowl. Calm down, said Joshua, placing his hand over the blind man's eyes. When I remove my hand, you will see again. I could see the strain in Joshua's face as he concentrated on healing the guard. Tears trickled down his cheeks and dripped on the flagstones. I thought of how effortless his healings had been in Antioch and realized that the strain was not coming from the healing, but from the guilt he carried for having blinded the man in the first place. <laughs> when he removed his hand and stepped away, both he and the guard shivered. Joy stepped away from us and covered her face as if to ward off bad air. The guard stared into space just as he had while he had been begging, but his eyes were no longer white. Can you see? Joshua said. I can see, but everything is wrong. People's skin appears blue. No, he is blue. Remember my friend Biff? Were you always blue? No, only recently. Then the guard seemed to see Joshua for the first time, and his expression of wonderment was replaced by hatred. He leapt at Joshua, drawing a dagger from his rags as he moved. He would have split my friend's ribcage in a single swift blow if Joy hadn't swept his feet out from under him at the last second. Even so, he was up in an instant, going for a second attack. I managed to get my hand up in time to poke him in the eyes, just as Joy kicked him in the back of the neck, driving him to the ground in agony. My eyes! He cried. Sorry, I said. <laughs> Joy kicked the knife out of the guard's reach. I put an arm around Joshua's chest and pushed him back. You need to put some distance between you and him before he can see again. But I only meant to help him, said Joshua. Blinding him was a mistake. <laughs> Josh, he doesn't care. All he knows is that you are the enemy. All he knows is that he wants to destroy you. I don't know what I'm doing. Even when I try to do the right thing, it goes wrong. We need to go, said Joy. <laughs> she took one of Joshua's arms <laughs> while I took the other and we led him away before the guard could gather his senses for another attack. Joy had a list of supplies that Balthazar wanted her to bring back to the fortress. 
So we spent some time tracking down large baskets of a mineral called cinnabar, from which he would extract quicksilver, as well as some spices and pigments. Joshua followed us through the market in a daze until we passed a merchant who was telling, excuse me, merchant who was selling the black beans from which was made the dark drink we'd had in Antioch. Buy me some, Joshua said. Joy, buy me some of those. She did, and Joshua cradled the bag of beans like an infant all the way back to the fortress. We rode most of the way in silence, but when the sun had gone down and we were almost to the hidden road and led up to the plateau, Joy galloped up beside me. How did he do it? she asked. What? I saw him heal that man's eyes. How did he do it? I know, I know many kinds of magic, but I saw no spells cast. No potions mixed. It's very powerful magic, all right. I checked over my shoulder to see if Joshua was paying attention. He was hugging his coffee beans and mumbling to himself, as he had for the whole trip. <laughs> Praying, I presume. Tell me how it's done, Joy said. I asked Joshua, but... He's just chanting and looking stunned. Well, I could tell you how it's done, but you have to tell me what's going on behind the ironclad door. I can't tell you that, but perhaps we can trade other things. She pulled the, tr the tail of her turban away from her face and smiled. She was stunningly beautiful in the moonlight even in men's clothes. I know over a thousand ways to bring pleasure to a man. And that's only what I know personally. The other girls have as many tricks that they'd be willing to show you too. <laughs> yeah, but how is that useful to me? What do I need to know about pleasing a man? <laughs> Joy ripped her turban off her head and smacked me across the back of the head with it, sending a small cloud of dust drifting into the night. You're stupid and you're blue, and the next time I poison you, I will be sure to use something without an antidote. Even the wise and inscrutable Joy could be goaded, I guess. I smiled. I will accept your paltry offerings, I said, with as much pomposity as an adolescent boy can muster. <laughs> and in return, I will teach the greatest secret of our magic, a secret of my own invention. We call it sarcasm. Let's make coffee when we get home, said Joshua. <laughs> well, that's it. All right. That's it for today. Love you guys.